So our axolotl is ready for surgery. You may recognize this dissection tray from dissections you might have done, cat dissection or um, in organismal and ecological biology lab, etc. We actually don't use these for axolotls. The reason is because I mentioned they breathe through their skin. I've got some wet paper towel and I'll just use a large petri dish and lay him on this dripping wet paper towel. So in order to pick up an axolotl, I've got these ridged forceps. They're not pointy at the end because I don't want to cut him, but the axolotl has what's called an operculum, a flap under their chin. So you know how dogs and cats and lions and other things will grab their young by the scruff of their neck and carry them around? It's the same, but this is on the underside. And you see me grabbing this flap of skin. I can pick up our axolotl by grabbing the flap of skin. And I lay him on the dripping wet paper towel. And I can isolate whichever por portion I would like to amputate. So remember, please, developmental biology students, we call this amputation under anesthesia. We never say things like chop somebody's limb off or something like that because we care about these animals. Okay? Seriously, they are my pets. So the animal has not moved since I picked it up. We know it's anesthetized. I can use some slightly for sharper forceps, if I can find a good pair, to hold the limb in place. But what I'm going to do, as you can see all the little fingers right here, here's the wrist, here's the elbow. I'm just going to cut through the radius and ulna. So I'm going to hold this limb in place and use a very sharp razor blade. And I'm just going to slide along right up against the metal here. And the limb cannot move either way because I'm holding it in place. So I'll just do a surgery of sliding. I hope my fingers are out of the way for you to see this. And the limb is off. So what do I do with the limb once I've got it off? Notice there is a little bit of blood. <clears throat> of course, we fix it in paraformaldehyde. Notice I am wearing gloves. Never want to hold, handle paraformaldehyde without gloves. I'll pour just a small amount of our paraformaldehyde into a falcon tube here, a 15 mil conical tube. And I can pick up this piece of limb and drop it, whoops, stuck to the side, into my conical tube. So here we've got our limb with all the digits splayed out. Notice the animal still has not moved. It is completely anesthetized. So some of the things that we would want to do in, in a regeneration experiment is measure how much we removed, right? How long was the region that we removed? Let's do that for the tail. Since these individuals can regenerate eyes, mouth, spinal cord, tail, limbs, uh, the animals tolerate very well to have multiple um, pieces harvested at once. I don't think I would ever really want to take more than a full centimeter here. Usually I go with a half a centimeter. Uh, but you can see that in the comparison to the length of his tail, a centimeter of length would be a small portion of his tail. He'll be able to regenerate that very quickly, uh, probably in a month to two months. So again, I'm going to uh, hold either side with the forceps and cut right through. I'll add this piece of tail to the exact same paraformaldehyde. And our buddy here, uh, Mijo, is ready to go back into his container. So we've, um, did you want us to try to see it under the microscope? Or, yeah, okay, let's put it under the microscope first. And I can move this around so you can get a good idea of the different parts of the axolotl. Let's first of all check out the gills. So right now we've got focused the gills of the axolotl. 
In the white axolotls, the uh, albinos, you can easily see red blood cells moving through the each feather of those gills. How about the eye? Am I there? Yes. Let's look at a normal limb. Here you can see their forelimbs have four digits. Their hind limbs have five digits. Isn't that interesting? And then we can look at the amputation plane. So here's the spot where we actually amputated the tail. Yes, there's a tiny bit of blood, but these guys are pretty good at closing off blood vessels that are leaking in a very quick manner so that they do not bleed extensively. Again, being cold-blooded, they have a blood pressure that is much lower than a, a mammal. They don't have to keep pumping all that energy to our cells to keep us warm. And so their lower blood pressure means they lose less blood, um, and they're able to swim around without da further damage to their limbs or tails, because all they have to do is reach their head up and grab some food from falling from the sky when we feed them. So last thing we'll do is, as gently as I can, in fact, actually, I think I'll grab the operculum flap here and drop him back in the water. We'll carefully monitor him for the next, oh, did you see that? The hand's already moving. Look at that. A little bit of, um, a little bit of motion back and forth. Oh, there we go. I didn't even have to touch. So I feel like I was a little bit lucky in terms of my anesthetization this time around, but you know he's going to survive. Anesthetization is a tricky business. If you over anesthetize, the heart actually start, stops beating, they die. This happens to humans in the hospital as well. That's why uh, anesthetists are so uh, highly sought after. Um, and uh, here, uh, we got him just under enough that he didn't feel any of the surgery, didn't squirm at all, and now back in the water, I'm starting to wake up already. So out of the MS-222 and back into his container with all his friends. We will, of course, give him some food as well as a reward for helping us with our regeneration experiment. And we'll watch over the next two weeks to see how the regeneration proceeds. Can you see the steps of growing a limb and growing a tail in action? That's what we'll look for next time.